Alright, today is Wednesday, October 19th, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight, and let's start by this. Yesterday, we talked about the market being a little bit arrogant with this uh, newfound optimism in earnings. And I told you that it's just going to take one big earnings to bomb, and all of this arrogance will be wiped out of the face of the stock market. And it appears that we got one today after the bell. Now, I don't know if this is going to last all the way till tomorrow or not, but it is. it doesn't look good right now. Let's just say that. And it is Tesla. And the name is down about six and a quarter of a percent after the bell, after reporting earnings. Now, I did look at the numbers, and they're not really that bad. The company continues to grow, but here's the problem. You have seen what happened today with yields. The 10-year exploded higher, along with the 2-year, and yields continue to move higher. Why? Well, they continue to move higher, and the reason is, the market is saying the Fed is way behind the curve and the Fed has to pivot. The actual pivot, not the one you're hoping for. And I'm talking about the Fed chairman, Jerome Powell, coming out in the next meeting and saying, hey folks, we are raising rates by 100 basis points. That is the pivot. Why? Because inflation continues to soar. And what the Fed has done so far, it is just a drop in the bucket. It's nothing. And when yields move higher, significantly so, valuations must be trimmed in the stock market. And we all know that one of the most overvalued stocks in history is Tesla. So regardless whether the report is good or not, it doesn't matter. It's a lagging indicator. And the market is looking for growth indicator for the next report. And they see a slowdown, meaning the valuation, the very rich and extreme valuation that Tesla holds right now, that is not merited and it has to be corrected down. And folks, I produced a video about two weeks ago for the members of this channel, and I said, Tesla shareholders, Tesla bulls, this is your last warning. Get the hell out, or at least buy some insurance, buy some puts, because a lot of bad things will happen once the market realizes that the growth story in Tesla is pretty much over. And what do you know, since that video, the stock is down about 20 three percent you're welcome and folks we're going to talk about this and a lot more in tonight's coverage but let's start by this it has been a while since we talked about the wall of worry and the wall includes uh, the broth of the dc what's going on between russia and ukraine china of course the fed's policy and it used to be the thing but we're now over the thing right it's over apparently pfizer and moderna made enough money right so now we have a new item in the wall of worry and that is europe slash UK. And believe it or not, this is really the most direct threat to the stock market and the global economy. It's not really Russia, Ukraine. We know what's going on in Russia, Ukraine. If it escalates, sure, we got a problem. And the trajectory for now is it will escalate. And this is a major problem. But for now, when we talk about financial markets, the most direct risk is what's going on in Europe, but most importantly, the United Kingdom, because something is going to blow up over there. And that will be the beginning of a contagious economic impact across the European continent. And this contagion will spread all the way across the Atlantic, and it will reach the economy of the United States of America. So this will be the main subject of tonight's program. And here it is in focus tonight. Bye bye Liz, her days are now numbered, and we're talking about maybe a few weeks or so max. And it wasn't long ago when we said bye bye Boris, what's going on in the UK? Absolute disaster, it's what's going on. You see, to begin with, the United Kingdom's economy is lagging its peers. While the majority of countries' economies recovered from the pandemic, the United Kingdom remains behind. So we know that we have a stagnation phenomenon in the UK economy. But on top of that, we also have an insane level of inflation. You combine stagnation with inflation, you got the most destructive economic phenomenon, and it is called stagflation. Today we got the report that inflation in Britain hits 10.1%, and the most disastrous element of all of this is that inflation is mainly driven right now by food prices, not by energy prices. We're seeing the same phenomenon here in the United States. Food prices are becoming a major headache, and they're leading the rise of inflation, not just in the UK, but also here in the United States. And it goes without saying that this is the highest rate of inflation since the 1980s. The highest rate of inflation in more than 40 years. We're seeing UK customers fearing the future. They have the lowest living standard since the World War. Even amidst the chaos of Brexit or the financial crash back in 2008-2009, the standard of living for Brits 
is now worse than any of these past phenomena and historical economic crashes combined. And of course, the reasoning for this is inflation. Take a look at the report that we got today. Food and drink price inflation has hit its highest level since April 1980. The figures show that food and non-alcoholic beverages prices rose by 14.6% year over year, up from 13.1 in August. Food inflation has now risen for the past or the last 14 months, up from negative 0.6% in July 2021. The largest upward effect came from bread, cereal, meat products, milk, cheese, and eggs in September. And even before this disastrous report, we knew ahead of time that the Bank of England is planning to raise rates by 200 basis points. And we're talking by November, folks. And of course, after today's report, rate hike expectations moved significantly higher. Now, what is the risk of all of that? We go back to the intro of this video. When rates move higher, valuations of equities, housing prices, the entire economy as a whole goes down. But what happens when we have at least a decade or so of quantitative easing, not just in the United States, but across the global economy? including the United Kingdom. We find the global economy emerging from quantitative easing era overwhelmed with debt and a lot of risk taking. Well, now all of a sudden rates are surging higher. Companies, debtors, banks, they cannot even catch a break, not to mention households, because the rise in rates is happening rapidly. And we know the risk. A lot of the zombie companies with a lot of debt, they're going to blow up right away. And on top of that, pension funds in the UK were about to blow up as we've seen rates move significantly higher by another phenomenon, which we're about to talk about in a minute. But before we do that, we also have a lot of risk taking in the economy. For example, in the UK, we have seen the phenomenon of buy to let mortgages, which involves a lot of speculation and leveraged risk taking. Now, when interest rates move higher, all of a sudden, we're going to see a lot of these mortgages blowing up, not to mention the numerous other corners in the UK economy that happens to be over leveraged. And this is the part of the story when uh, Liz Truss walks in. You see, Boris Johnson is out. We got Liz Truss. Uh, what do you know? The first thing she does is uh, attempt to channel Thatcher, and she thought it is a genius idea to initiate a massive tax-cutting program for the wealthy, of course, amidst the highest inflation in 40 years. And it's not a surprise that the market's reaction was negative. The British pound went down crashing every day, every hour, every minute. On top of that, yields spiked significantly higher in the UK. And this, in effect, pushed the borrowing cost in the UK significantly higher in what is now known as the Moron Premium. And the Moron Premium cost the United Kingdom at least 20 billion pounds just right away from that move alone. And global financial markets started to panic. The pound is crashing, yields are shooting up significantly higher. Something is going to blow up in the UK. And of course, the Bank of England had to intervene. They had no other choice. And they intervened by pausing quantitative tightening and going back to quantitative easing to push yields down. And they bought billions and billions of dollars worth of gilts to stabilize the bond market in the UK. And today we got the news that the UK Treasury is transferring about 11 billion pounds to the Bank of England to compensate them for the rescue operation in the gilt market. But the damage is done, folks. The confidence by global investors in the UK economy is plummeting. For example, according to the Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey, we're now seeing the fund's overweight rate in the UK dropping like a rock. And on top of that, according to the same survey, managers are the most bearish in the United Kingdom than any other economy. And of course, to save face and restore global confidence in the UK economy, the genius Liz Truss decided to fire her own chancellor, Quartang, so let the black guy take the blame and throw him under the bus and hope that this will work. ...from the electorate, and no political leaders come back from the kind of poll ratings that you're currently enduring. What makes you want to go on? What I'm focused on is delivering for the British public. Now, I recognise we have made mistakes. What are you? An idiot sandwich. I'm sorry uh, for those mistakes. What are you? An idiot sandwich. But I fixed the mistakes. I've appointed a new chancellor. What are you? An idiot sandwich. Uh, we have restored economic stability and fiscal discipline. And what I now want to do is go on and deliver for the public. We were elected on the 2019 manifesto. I'm determined to deliver on that. Leveling up, securing investment into all parts of our country, 
getting roads built, getting opportunities right across the nation. And that's what I'm thinking about. And that's what I'm focused on. But unfortunately for Liz Trust, it is not working. And the bleeding continues to go on. We're now hearing reports that the entire British government is about to collapse. Even though Liz Truss appointed Hunt as a new chancellor, and his first act is get rid of every aspect of what is now known as Trussonomics, the disaster that that is. And by the way, wasn't this Hunt guy also in power a few years ago? What's going on in the UK, shuffling all of these clowns all the time? and hoping for a better result. It's not gonna happen this way. You need something new. You need something fresh beside these clowns. But anyways, the collapse of the Truss government is continuing by the day. Today, we got the news that more and more members of her cabinet are resigning. And of course, when somebody becomes such a toxic political personality, even your own allies are gonna dump you right before you even realize what happened. And this is exactly what's going on with Liz Truss. Even her own party is now weighing in ways to replace her. So we know that her days are numbered. And even as she met the king, he greeted her with, Oh dear dear, you f And we now know that Liz Truss's days are numbered. It's just a matter of days before she resigns. Even though she came out today defiant, saying that she apologizes for her mistake, the mistake that is now worth about, what, over 20 billion pounds? But she learned from these lessons, and she fixed it. She got rid of the guy, the chancellor. Now, unfortunately for Liz, this was met by ridicule in the parliament today. Take a look. Mr. Speaker, I have been very clear that I am... Mr. Speaker, that I am sorry, and that I have made mistakes. But the right thing to do in those circumstances is to make changes which I've made and to get on with the job and deliver for the British people. And Mr Speaker, we've delivered the energy price guarantee, we've helped people this winter and I will continue to do that. And I wish we had this kind of manners here in the United States Congress. The problem is, if it was allowed, there would be non-stop laughter in D.C. because it is the biggest freak show in the planet. But anyways, now even the bookies are betting that a head of lettuce will outlive Liz Truss's tenure. And the question becomes here, at least in the United States, is it for real, Maverick? Is her days really numbered? Is Liz Truss really toast? I will let Englishman uh, Piers Morgan explain this to you. First, everything. He now has all the power. The markets have kind of stabilized, but they're really waiting to see, even now, given the damage that she has done with this budget to the stability economically of the country, it's believed they now need to find another 20 billion just to repair the damage of is what they've done. Is she toast then? Or how would you describe I think, I mean, I love my toast, and I would say she right. is toast with a fresh spread of butter and a dollop of Marmite, because wow. I don't see any way that she survives this. Her credibility has been completely destroyed destroyed at a speed I've never seen for any prime minister or any world leader but she in such a short space of time. the next Maggie Thatcher. Here's the problem with that. Yeah. She said repeatedly that she was Thatcherite in her thinking. When Margaret Thatcher came to power, she actually inherited quite a rough economy. She didn't cut taxes. She actually put a number of taxes up. She actually did do a windfall tax against energy companies. By doing all that, she managed to cool inflation and stabilize the British economy. When it was stabilized from a position of strength, then she slashed income tax and became known as the great tax cutter. Right. But that should always tread very carefully, step by step, getting the, the economy to a place where you could be bold. This wasn't bold. This was casino politics. It was reckless. It was disgraceful. And I, honestly, I've never seen anything quite like this. I would be staggered if she lasts a week. But, really? if she, but if she does, the happiest person will be Sakia Starmer, leader of the opposition Labour Party, who is, I think, 36 points but ahead they can't of the have an election. And folks, here's my obituary for Liz Truss, because we know her days are numbered, she's toast. And I say maybe she's a lousy politician, but damn it, she got great legs. I mean, let's put it this way. She's more pleasant to look at than Boris Johnson, that's for sure. And if it was a better economic circumstance, I would have said, let's give Truss another chance. She deserved it, right? I mean, what's uh, 20 billion pounds between friends? But unfortunately for Liz, the only way to restore confidence in the UK economy by markets right now is for Liz to say, I resign. So hereby I say, bye bye Liz. See you later. And with that folks, let's move on to cover the stock market information for you. We begin with the closing of the indices today and uh, here we go.
The Dow Industrial Average down by 99.99 points, also known as 100 points, or a decline of 0.33%. The Nasdaq down by 91.89 points, or a decline of 0.85%. The S&P 500 down by 24.82 points, or a decline of 0.67%. The uh, Netflix optimism did not hold on. And when we look at the uh, sector's performances today, leading the pack at number one, capturing the gold, the silver, and the bronze. And energy on the uh, release of the SPR optimism. Wow, what a bunch of geniuses. Let's raise energy prices further by depleting the SPR. What a bunch of geniuses. What a bunch of clowns. I'd like to hear some resignation here in this government. But anyways, the laggards of the day led by REITs, cyclicals, and healthcare. When it comes to the advance to decline ratios, NYSE 22% advancing versus 76% declining. The NASDAQ, a pathetic 23% advancing versus 74% declining. Moving on to commodities, look at this. Uh, SPR depletion optimism is pushing energy prices higher. The WTI gained about 3.5% for the day. Brent gained about 3%, while the gasoline RBOB gained about 3 and a 3 quarters of a percent today. Congratulations. On the other hand, heating oil is down about 4.5% and the declines in natural gas continue. Nat gas was down about 5.5%. At some point, this will become a buying opportunity. Maybe not right now, but as soon as we get news that the winter season and storms are about to hit, specifically across the Atlantic and Europe, that will be a buying opportunity for natural gas. And folks, the inflation in energy prices is not going to stop anytime soon. We talked about diesel. It is moving higher. It's about to make a new high. We will look at the inventories, the supplies. We now have the worst inventories since 2008. Is anybody paying attention to this? And it gets even worse. When we talk about fuel inventories in the month of October. We are now at the lowest levels of inventories since the 1950s. Once again, the lowest level of inventories, the lowest level of supply since the 1950s. Again, any politician, any of these clown economists paying attention to this, what do you think will happen, folks? Inflation is not going to go anywhere. And we might see disastrous outcomes this winter. For example, we will look at the inventories in New England. Look at this, way below the average. And the winter season is coming. It's not going to stop because the inventories are low. It's not going to say, hey, folks, I'll give you a break until you top off the inventories. So what is going to happen if we get a harsh winter season in New England? What are they going to do? Freeze? Use uh, coal? Maybe wood like Germany? And just an FYI, New England was dependent on Russian oil, believe it or not. So now when we cut Russian oil, we did not replace the inventories in New England. What a bunch of geniuses. Now the region is short and winter is coming. Back to the futures, when we talk about softs, we have yet another day worth of gains in lumber, up about 3.5%. OJ, we know the catalyst, the shortage in supplies due to the storm, and yet we have another day worth of gains for OJ futures worth about 1%. On the other hand, we have muted declines, modest declines for cocoa and sugar futures. On the other hand, notable declines led by cotton futures, down about 5% for the day, and then coffee futures continue to move down, losing about two and a quarter percent today alone. And the reason is the supplies from Brazil are better than expected. When we talk about metals, the dollar is moving higher again. So naturally, gold down, silver down, platinum down, copper down, palladium down. Everything is down. This is the metals recession. On the other hand, we have green activities across the board in meats. You see, food inflation is now the captain of the ship. It used to be energy. It used to be metals. Not anymore. Now it's food, and soon enough, energy might make a comeback. It might be the co-pilot with food, and that would be a disastrous outcome for the economy. But anyhow, live cattle, feeder cattle, lean hogs futures, all in the green today, with gains of about 1% apiece for both live cattle and lean hogs. When we talk about grains, down across the board, for the most part, oats was down about 3.5%, wheat was down about 1%, but yet we see gains in oils, soybean oil continues to rally higher, and today it added about 2.5% worth of gains. We know the deal here with the sunflower oil out of Ukraine, the shortage of supply, and therefore we're seeing canola moving higher too. And the chart of canola is showing a bull flag pattern, the indication is canola prices will move higher too. On to the big casino, the options market. What's going on here? The volume 
a little bit higher today, but we're seeing traders shifting back toward puts, betting that the market will go down. And the hottest table was Tesla at around 1.6 million contracts traded today. About 54% of those were calls. The way Tesla is trading after hours, a lot of these people who bought calls, well, they're going to eat a massive amount of pies in the morning. But at number two, Apple with around 1 million contracts traded today. Look at this, about 64% of those were puts. This baby is going to crack. This baby is going to blow. And once it does, the entirety of the market will take a massive leg down. Regardless, the number three was Netflix, with about 850,000 contracts traded today. Once again, fading the rip with about 51% of the volume traded as puts, not calls. And here it is, the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. And we start with the SMH. This is the CHIPS ETF, and we have a major trade here. Somebody sees the bottom is in in CHIPS, and they're betting for more upside to come. They bought the 205 calls for the expiration date, December 16th, with expectations that the name could move higher and gain more than 15% by then. They paid around 3 bucks and 65 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $17.5 million. And then what about the commodities giant? EWZ Brazil. Somebody sees more upside here and they bought the 34 calls for the expiration date November 4th. I shouldn't say more gains because it has been trading really bad but somebody sees let's say a rebound, a reversal of course. Anyways they paid around 90 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around 1 million dollars. And the expectations here are that the EWZ will gain over 5% by the expiration date of November 4th. And then we have the ticker WYNN win. Somebody sees an upside coming here for the name and they bought the 60 bucks calls for the expiration date December 16th with expectations that the name could move higher and gain more than 10% by then. They paid around 3 bucks and 75 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around 3.3 million dollars. And then what about the ticker SPY for the S&P 500? Somebody's fading the rip here and they bought the 345 puts for the expiration date November 7th with expectations that the SPY could move down and lose more and 6% of its value by then. They paid around 2 bucks and 40 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around 1.8 million dollars. And lastly, what about the ticker NFLX for Netflix? The name traded higher today by double digits. There are mechanical reasons on why it traded significantly higher, but somebody's fading the rip here and they bought the 250 puts for the expiration date November 18th with the expectations that Netflix will go down and lose more than 8% of its value by then. They paid around 8 bucks and 80 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around 5 million dollars. On to the heat map, what's going on here? Mostly in the red, and this time around even the healthcare slash big pharma names, which we usually think of as safe, went down big. And of course, when yields move higher, significantly higher, we see real estate and utilities moving down. And this is exactly what we got. Likewise, when we see the dollar shooting up higher, we see gold and metals down, we see the multinationals down, we even see banks down. So all of this uh, banks earnings optimism, that's bullshit. They're going to fade away because... On one hand, you can say, okay, yields are going higher and banks will benefit. But there's a flip side to this coin, which is number one. We're going to see a lot of defaults coming as yields continue to move higher. They're going to lose a lot on these defaults. On top of that, lending will slow down in the economy. This is the main source of income for banks. And on top of that, the market is not doing pretty good. So trading and investing revenue will go down. So this bullshit narrative that we got this week, that you got to be in banks, no thanks. And of course, as yields move higher, technology, the speculative names, the RKK kind of names, they go down. So biotechnology was down big. Software was down big. And when we talk about the cyclicals, they're down. Even the Chinese names are down. Alibaba, JD, Pindudu, all of this uh, Xi optimism is fading. Not that he's going to lose the elections or anything. But we have some green pockets. And these green pockets came from names that reported earnings. For example, we have names like Procter & Gamble in the green in defensives. We have the airlines trading in the green on the heels of United Airlines earnings, which are not good, by the way, despite what the media says. I'm going to explain that to you in details when I do my earnings review video. But we also have more gains for Lockheed Martin and the defense contractors. We saw gains in chip manufacturers such as ASML, AMAT, LAM Research. We're not talking about the designers. We're talking about the supply suppliers of these equipments for chip manufacturing, which are, by the way, leading indicators to what's about to happen to chips. So the trade that you just saw, the SMH, about $17 million, bullish activities, betting, 
the SMH will move higher. They're doing this because they got the results from ASML, they got the results from AMAT, and now they got the results from LAM Research after the bell. At least this trader looks at the results as positive leading indicator for chips that the worst is behind. I disagree because we have the dollar, we have more crushing of demand, but to each his own. But again, leading the gains is the last remaining bull market, which is energy. And today, the release of the SPR was yet another positive catalyst, another tailwind. And you see all of these energy names moving higher. And folks, I told you in the past that I'm trying to limit my portfolio exposure. We're talking about my long portfolio to five names, mostly defensive names. Well, I have to admit that I failed in this endeavor because now I find myself overweight with energy stocks. Now I have Oxy, I have Devon, I have Valero, I have Marathon, I have Slumberger, and I also have exposure to natural gas in Cotera. So I feel that I went a little crazy here and I need to tone it down. We'll see what happens. I'm going to think about it in the weekend. Maybe I need to limit my exposure to, let's say, three or two names rather than acting like I'm in the candy store. Anyhow, what about the heat map for the ETFs? A sea of red across the board with few exceptions here. And the exception, you guessed them, the energy names XOP, XLE, OIH, all in the green. Even USO traded in the green today. But we're seeing also some weakness in natural gas, UNG, BOIL. They're not doing pretty good, at least not right now. Of course, gold miners, GDX, down about 3% for the day. This is your confirmation that the dollar is going higher. And if we got any theme from the earnings that we got so far, the dollar is wrecking havoc here. Look at Procter & Gamble, for example. That should have been a decent report. But the dollar absolutely annihilated the earnings for Procter & Gamble. And if the dollar continues to move higher, we're not going to see any positive reaction in the stock market. We're certainly not going to see the bottom until we see the top in the dollar. But let's move on to charts and we start with the S&P 500 SPY 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? The development was the loss of 368 of support, but by the end of the day, that was recaptured again. Now, what are the damages here? Number one, we got a reverse ABC pattern and that is completed now. So is it over? The bears would argue not over yet because we now have a bear flag consolidation, which means we're going to see a flush down to the next support of 362.16, aka the June bottom. If that is lost, we go down to the gap. If the gap is lost, we're shit out of luck. But hold your horses because the bulls would say, not so fast. Look at what happened by the end of the day. The chart went down, it closed the gap, and it closed the day above the gap. This is bullish behavior, not bearish. And I say the bears are closing in. They're starting to gain the advantage here because they have multiple points to argue with beside the point that the bulls have for now. Let's see if the daily chart improves things for the bulls or not. For now, we have positive momentum in the RSI and the MACD. This is good for the bulls. The volume still below average. This is yet another sign, good sign, I should say, for the bulls. The bad is they lost the support, at least at the time of the recording of this video, they lost the support of 3,720 and a half. But we're not going to say that this is over until we see a loss of 3,600. So for now, on the daily chart, the bulls still have the advantage. But boy, the bomb from Tesla and who knows what else. That's going to make a lot of people rethink this uh, rebound ratty, bear market ratty, dead cat bounce mat, whatever. Doesn't matter. And when we zoom in to the same chart, the continuous contract for the S&P, this is a 30 minutes chart. Once again, look at this. We have a curve pattern for resistance and the chart keeps heading it over and over and over again and it's not making it. And it happens to be that the last three tests coincided with 3,720 and a half, which is another resistance level that we have on the chart. And it happens to be a critical and important level. The bulls need to recapture this level because if they fail to do so, the bears will be emboldened that at least the chart will go all the way down to the, let's say, my June bottom at 3,600. And for now, what does this look like? How about a reverse ABC pattern? Another way to look at it, how about a bear flag pattern? Again, this is a 30 minutes chart. It's not that significant, but these are all early warning signs that we might go down and retest 3,600. What about the Qs? No major move here, unlike the SPY, because the Qs kept the June bottom at 269.29. And until we see this number lost to support, and maybe this will happen as soon as tomorrow, because Tesla has a major rating in the NASDAQ, we're not going to become bearish. So a loss of this support means the bears have to be on alert that we might have another shorting opportunity, and it could be a big one. But it's not going to happen right away, because we have to go down to close the gap after that, and then retest the lows 
news and the real catalyst will happen if one of these major big cap technology names bomb. We're talking about Microsoft. We're talking about Apple, most importantly. But Google, Meta will do the job. Now, here is the daily chart for the continuous contract for the NASDAQ. Not a lot of damage done here because the chart is keeping its June bottom at around 11,058 and a half. The volume is below average. The momentum indicators are positive now, both in the RSI and the MACD. So for now, the bulls remain in charge and we're waiting for them to show us what they got. Is this all you got? Because a loss of 11,058 and a half, and this could happen by tomorrow, because Tesla's down, this will be a signal for the bears that the bulls don't have it. They don't have it in them. And this means we're going to have a lower low. Once the bears are emboldened and they start piling in buying puts, it becomes a self-fulfilling phenomenon because we will see a reverse gamma squeeze. And when we zoom in to the 30 minutes chart for the continuous contract of the NASDAQ, again, it is keeping support the most important number but is this a formation of a bear flag pattern and if it is then down we go and here's the IWM 30 minutes chart what's going on here the chart went down did not respect the gap at around 172.15 and it is forming a bear flag pattern the Russell was the underperformer today and some would argue that the Russell is a leading indicator I don't believe in that but it works once in a while if it is this time around, then down we go in the SPY and the Qs too. The good news for now is the support of 168.90 is intact, but for how long? For now, the chart remains negative, believe it or not, because we have negative divergences in both the RSI and the MACD. We need to see a lot of work. We need to see 174.22 recapture the support before we say we're out of the woods here in the IWM. Absent of that, the assumption is sooner or later we're going to go down below to 164.91 and breach that support once and for all. But just to illustrate for you the importance of the support of 172.15, the previous gap, let's zoom in to a 5 minutes chart and you can see that the chart did respect the number, both the support and resistance, but the chart could not keep hold on to this number and it failed by the end of the day. Here's the dollar index, what's going on here? We have gains. The dollar is moving higher. It is facing the resistance at around 113. And the question now becomes, is the reverse ABC pattern hopes gone now? The answer is not yet. And the reason is, it is still possible. We have negative divergence on the RSI. However, if the dollar moves higher, let's say in tomorrow's session, it will kill the hopes of any reverse ABC pattern. We will see positive divergence on the RSI. So watch out for this. And here's another way we can look at the dollar. At least dollar bulls will argue if we switch to a line chart that this is a formation of a bull flag pattern and it is already playing out. And sooner or later, the dollar is going to make higher highs. And the confirmation for all of that is gold. Gold is now saying I'm going to bail out. I don't have the energy and the support to make it above 1,671. It gave it a shot. It tried over and over and over again. But now the behavior of the chart says gold is waving the white flag saying I don't have it in me. I'm going to go down, and by going down, I'm going down to 1600 If that is the case, gold makes a lower low. You put two and two together, the dollar is going to make a higher high. Here is uh, UK oil, Brent, the daily chart. And the question is, are we seeing the beginning of the C leg in the ABC pattern? If that is the case, it will get us all the way to at least 105.43. And here is the most important chart of the day, the 10-year yield. We have a breakout. And look at this, all of this energy from the consolidation within the range is being released to the upside. This is bad news for equities bulls, very good news for yield bulls, meaning equity bears. When we look at the TLT weekly chart, it is in a free fall and the next support would be 87.94. Even though it's oversold, even though this is a massacre, it could get even uglier. But here's perhaps the best hope for the bulls, the VIX 4 hours chart. We have a trend line, and it appears that the VIX is having a hard time holding into this support. It gave it a shot today, could not make it. It's not over yet, but it needs the flush down. We need to see a flush down, another big candle to the downside saying, hey, the support line is not going to hold, and that would be a confirmation for the bulls, that the SPY should have another leg higher. But my hunch is, after days worth of gains in the SPY, some massive days worth of gains, the VIX continues in its uh, relative ad performance. Yes, it's down, but it's not down as much as it should when we have all of this action in the SPY. I see this as just a matter of time before the VIX pops higher again. And here's Apple, a daily chart. What's going on here? Yes, it did close down, but nothing changed because it is above the gap support. 
It is below 145, but the volume is below average and the momentum indicators are turning positive, not negative. And we might even see some short covering ahead of Apple's earnings. But when we look at the weekly chart, the monthly chart, the momentum is negative. The trajectory is negative. We know the deal. When we zoom into a 30 minutes chart for Apple, for example, for now, we got the reverse ABC pattern. That was a warning shot by the bears. Today, the bulls did buy Apple once again, but they faced resistance at around 145. This is going to be really stiff, 145. But the good news is the bulls are still holding on the support in the yellow line this happens to be a previous gap at around 143 and until that's broken and we get another rejection from 145 we're not going to say that the bulls are gone yet keyword yet and here's tesla an hourly chart what's going on here we talked about the bear flag consolidation pattern today we saw a continuation of this consolidation pattern holding onto the support of 217.88 but we know what happened after the bell and the trajectory is the stock should go down all the way we have support at 206.86 but most likely this support is not going to hold and we will see the chart going all the way down to closing the gap and my hunch is that's not going to hold either and lastly what about bitcoin a four hours chart for btc anything new here not at all it is retesting the upper range. Some would see this action as relative at performance by Bitcoin, meaning we might see money moving to Bitcoin instead of equities. When certain money managers say, hey, look, the stock market is not keeping in a ratty. It keeps going down and down and down, but Bitcoin is holding. And if that is the case, that could be the catalyst that Bitcoin is needing to move higher and break out of this consolidation pattern. However, in my opinion, the reason behind Bitcoin holding into this consolidation pattern is we have people who are still holding on gains. They bought Bitcoin at 10,000, 8,000, and they're setting on gains. They have no motivation at all to dump Bitcoin right now. Those who bought at 60,000, 50,000, they're already flushed out. They're gone now. They lost their money. Goodbye. So the psychology is really important. What will break the will and the resolve of the holders right now? Number one, a technical breakout that would be a break below 18,000. But number two, if we see another big negative catalyst in the market with either yields shooting up higher, the dollar shooting up significantly higher, the Fed becoming even more aggressive, that will make these holders capitulate and we will see Bitcoin flushing down big time all the way to 15,000 and then 10,000. So the psychology is really important. In this case, the psychology is even more important than the technicals. In any case, let's move on to the conclusion of this video. and What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have the initial jobless claims along with the Philly Fed Manufacturing Index, along with existing home sales, and most importantly, leading economic indicators. And then on the earnings calendar, we have AT&T, American Airlines, Union Pacific, and then after the bell, we have Snapchat. And with that, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Now we'll talk to you again tomorrow. Take care. So as charming as you are, Mr. Bond, I will be keeping my eye on our government's money and off your perfectly formed hearts. You noticed? Even accountants have imagination.